Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, class BC 308 on um, Daniel and Revelation. Thank you for connecting to the class. We are joining uh, through the book of Daniel right now, going through it step by step, little by little. So let's uh, take a moment to pray together and then we will get started. Could one of us please lead in prayer? Let's start. Thank you, Father, uh, for this time that you've given us. Uh, thank you, Father, for um, helping us uh, understand these uh, uh, biblical truths, Father Lord, which otherwise, Lord, are not um, uh, for us to understand these, Father. Um, you have given us this opportunity, Father, to um, uh, Father, to learn uh, on these um, uh, eschatological uh, topics, Father Lord, in the book, from the books of uh, Daniel and Revelation, Father. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray, Lord, that um, our... Um, uh, you open our eyes, Lord, of understanding, Lord. Um, uh, we pray, Father, that you help our um, ears uh, to be receptive, Lord, in your heart, uh, Father, to receive, uh, Lord, what you want us to say, uh, Father, and reveal to us through these uh, uh, Father uh, prophecies, Father. I pray, Lord, that um, as uh, in the ep epistles, Father, uh, it has been said to watch and pray, Father, um, for and be prepared for your coming. Father, we pray, Father, that you uh, help us understand and know the seasons that we are living in. Uh, we thank you and praise you for uh, Pastor Ashish, Lord. I pray for your uh, strength and grace upon him. I pray, uh, Lord, that um, uh, all our classmates be able to join, Father, and be able to um, have a, um, a session, um, Lord, uh, complete and uh, clear for them, Father. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. So just to quickly recap, we started our journey um, through the book of Daniel. Um, week before last, last week, we didn't have class because of our uh, um, conference happening. And so we, just to quickly review before we move forward, uh, the book of Daniel, are we Gave a little bit of background, the meaning of Daniel when this was written about 600 to uh, 500 BC. Uh, and uh, we looked at you know, the purpose, the character, the language, um, the languages used, uh, typically how the book is divided when people study it, uh, sometimes a question about its genuineness because people are amazed at the prophecy. Uh, that's recorded for us in Daniel. And just a little bit of background of uh, history, the, the different empires that went through uh, with approximate dates. We're not saying these dates are precise, uh, but these are generally uh, dates, general dates given of the different empires that went through from the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medes, Persians, Greeks, uh, the Romans, and so on. Uh, so we put that in tabular form. and. Uh, then we went through chapter 2, uh, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, and God reveals the dream and the interpretation to Daniel. And I think there's this little image here that will help us, uh, where uh, he has this dream where there's an image, the head of gold, the chest of silver, uh, the waist of uh, uh, brass, legs of iron, and very interestingly, the feet uh, are iron and clay mixed together, and there are the ten toes. So what we said was, I mean, and, and the, the, the meaning is actually given to us in chapter 2 itself. A lot of it is already given to us in chapter 2, where uh, uh, each portion of this image is representing a kingdom, or we, we would use the word empire. And uh, the very topmost empire, is identified for us. It's the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar 
represented in the Babylonian Empire. And the others will come forth, uh, will be revealed as we journey through. And what we saw is in the days of these kings that, and these kingdoms here, the feet, iron and clay mixed, a loosely held together uh, territory, where clay is representing people from all the other nations, from everyone, just mixed with the iron, which are remnants of the former empire. They're held loosely in the days of that kingdom or that uh, uh, empire being in place, God himself sets up his kingdom here on earth. So what we said was that Daniel chapter 2 is kind of an outline of all that is going to be unveiled in the rest of this book. And as we progress, more and more details of things are being revealed to us. We also looked at the end of uh, chapter 4, uh, where, uh, sorry, at the end of chapter 5, sorry, now uh, where uh, this is the grandson of ne King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. He's you know, having a big feast in his palace, and he's actually using the, the utensils that had been taken from the temple, and he's just celebrating. And then that moment of that, uh, that big celebration, something strange happens. A hand is seen that's writing some inscription on the wall. And they don't know what to do, so they call for Daniel. And Daniel interprets and says, you know, King, you, you've been weighed in the balance and you have been found wanting. And tonight your and, and your kingdom is going to be handed over to the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel is identifying this part, the, the, the chest. He's saying, okay, the next, they're going to come in and they're going to take over. This is Daniel chapter 5 and verse 28. The Medes and the Persians are going to come. And that happened that same night. And uh, the Medes attacked, overthrew the Babylonian, Belshazzar, and uh, overthrew his empire, and the Medes took over. Right? So we stopped the end of Daniel chapter 5. We're going to skip Daniel chapter 6 because it's uh, uh, it's more of a record of history of what happened uh, with Daniel as he was serving. So uh, we, we are going to look into primarily the prophetic scriptures. We're going now into chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, um, and uh, as we read chapter 7, we will read through the whole chapter, uh, uh, and then we will, you know, look at it, but uh, just as a way of introduction or for things to look at, when we read Daniel chapter 7, we are going to read about all kinds of strange beasts, uh, strange creatures. And these kinds of these creatures, you know, like they, they part of it represent, you know, you look at the lion or the bear, yeah, we understand that. But then it's a complicated, each image is complicated. So we read about these bees, and uh, then we wonder, like, you know, what do these bees mean? But what I want to, I want us to see is the meaning is given in the chapter itself. So we don't have to look far; just keep reading the chapter, and the meaning of the, you know, what those beasts represent uh, are given in the chapter. And it's connected to what was given in Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 2, like we said, is an outline. Here you're actually seeing more details of all of that. So you can actually correlate or map what you're seeing in chapter 7 with what was given in chapter 2. Right? We will do that. And additionally, we are given more insight to what happens when the God of heaven sets up his kingdom here on earth. Remember in chapter 2, he said, he said, you know, that the, the, the rock became a big mountain and it, it extended its influence over all the earth. The mountain was so powerful, it was a kingdom, God's kingdom. So what happens when that is that kingdom is established? Insight is given to us here in chapter 7. So it's a, it's a beautiful chapter. Uh, the meaning of all the imagery that we see is given to us within the chapter itself, so it makes it makes it easy to understand. Let's go ahead. Um, let's uh, you know, like what we've done before, uh, maybe two. Or let's say maybe three verses each. Uh, we will read Daniel chapter seven, three verses each, and then we will start looking at what it means, uh, portion by portion. So we just, uh, you know, take, take turns. Anybody wants to read, just go ahead and read, please. Okay. 
Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great bees came up from the sea, each from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was standing up on one side and had three ribs, and its mouth between its teeth, and they said to, and they said, thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had which had on its back four wings of a of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Verse seven and on. After this, I saw. After this, I saw in the ninth vision and viewed the fourth beast terrifying and dreadful, and as really strong. It had great iron teeth. The war and broke in was. It was different from all the beasts that were before. Before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns and viewed the. Old, the there came up among them among another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horn were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Verse 9 on, please. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous vo words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13. On. I saw in the night vision, and the youth, in the cloud of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and it came to the ancients of this, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Verse 15 on, please. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. 
I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. <clears throat> so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verse 19. On. I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its feet of iron and its nail of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the city with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely the, that horn which had eyes and mouth which spoke from his words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. First, let's go on. Until the ancient of days came. And the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess their kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, assemble it, and break it in pieces. Verse 24 on. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and, a, and half a time. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Okay, that's 27, 28, so much. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. The kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my mind, in my heart. Mm. Amen. So, thank you. Daniel chapter 7. Amazing chapter. Let's look at the, um, the picture that we had earlier so as we uh, try to understand this, uh, this chapter. So, Daniel, in this vision um, that he had, and he's recording, he has recorded this vision for us. Um, he is seeing something happen. So Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. He's seeing the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. So, wind, four winds, great sea. What is the great sea? So one of the things I think we mentioned last class was um, when we're interpreting these images, we will look into the scriptures itself to, you know, what do these images represent in scripture and, of course, in context, uh, and then draw the meaning from it, right? The great sea or the waters typically represent people. So we see this in uh, Revelation chapter 17, uh, and um, uh, uh, we see in Revelation 17 and verse 1, uh, there's this great harlot who sits on many waters. And in that same chapter in Revelation 17, and, 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 and you know, remember that this 
Revelation 17. Uh, it's all part of uh, end time prophetic scripture. So it's all in context. It's in relation to each other. And Revelation 17, verse 15, the meaning of the image of waters is given. Revelation 17, 15. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So waters. Okay? So the, the prophetic meaning or the image of waters, or here in Daniel 7, verse 2, the great sea, the waters. In prophetic context, prophetic uh, in, in end times prophetic text. In that context, the waters, the great sea represents the nation. People, tongues, tribes, nations. So he's saying in Daniel 7, verse 2, I'm seeing the four winds of heaven. That's that means there are the there's a movement of God, the force of God Himself, you know, the move of God, God Himself is moving upon the nations. So this is something being orchestrated divinely the four winds of heaven uh, being moved or you can and if you want to use the word forces of heaven or the, the move of moving of God God himself is moving upon the nations and he's orchestrating all of these things to take place so what he's saying is verse 3 Daniel 7 verse 3 that from the sea that means from among the nations all these people he's seeing these four beasts coming right now uh, these four beasts are very strange looking because we are seeing a lion with wings, bear with you know um, uh, with, uh, ribs coming out of its mouth and teeth between its teeth. So they look very strange. Uh, what we need to do, what we need to keep in mind is when we are seeing prophetic imagery, we shouldn't start getting into all the details of the image unnecessarily example oh lion lion has a tail what does the tail represent lion has four legs what does each leg represent those kind of things we should not do we should only look at the details so the scripture is telling us to look at example when we see the lion uh, which the verse four there was a lion which had eagle's wings the scripture is not telling us, oh, what those eagles' wings mean. It's not, it's not highlighting that. It is saying this animal, like a lion, has eagle's wings. Then the bear, it's got three ribs in the mouth and the teeth. It's not telling us, you know, look at the ribs and the teeth. It's not telling us. But when we come to the fourth beast, and it says, this beast had ten horns, then the scripture is telling us what the ten horns are. Okay, so now the scripture is point, putting a spotlight on, hey, the ten horns that this fourth beast has, I want you to pay attention to it. Okay, so uh, the point I want to say is, when we are seeing prophetic imagery, uh, don't start jumping into every little detail of every image, because then we will end up with unnecessary uh, ideas that you know you can't substantiate like some people oh the lion lion represents the united kingdom wings represent wings of eagle that represents the united states you know because you know the united kingdom has lion as its emblem there and uh, the united states has the the eagle the bald eagle so you know you'll, you'll find people sometimes making these kinds of interpretations which are not there from the Bible. It's not, it's not there in the scripture. Right? So we shouldn't jump to those kinds of uh, extrapolations. That means you're, you're trying to stretch the image and make it mean something which is not in the original uh, intent of what is given. When the scripture itself is putting a spotlight on something, like, hey, look, pay attention to the ten horns from the fourth beast, then we pay attention. What is the ten horns? What, what do they mean? Because the scripture is telling us pay attention to it. All right? So that's also something to keep very uh, keep in mind as we try to understand. It. So he's, he's saying he describes these four images. Right? That is uh, till verse eight, uh, 7. And then he says this 
fourth image had ten, the fourth beast, oh, this is uh, Daniel 7 verse 7, uh, had uh, ten horns. And then in verse 8, he's thinking about these ten horns. Hmm, what are these ten horns? And then he says, then I'm seeing another little horn coming. And it is overriding or it's overpowering three three of these ten horns. And then this little horn, this is in verse eight, is beginning beginning to speak uh, pompous words. Plus, you know, later on we see blasphemies. Well, this is speaking. Like this. He's thinking about this. Okay. While all this is happening, the scene changes. And verses 9 to 14, something else happens. He's seeing the ancient of days, God the Father. So, you know, the, 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 the description is there. It's very human-like, meaning he is seated on a throne. He has a garment so white, perfect. He's got hair on his head. Yeah, and uh, there's this 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 fiery flame coming from the throne. So he's just describing, you know, the image of what he's saying. Right? Um, uh, this is this the, the greatness of everything, and there are literally thousands and thousands of people uh, standing for him and ministering to him. And and uh, while this is happening from the earth, verse eleven, this little horn is speaking. All these blasphemous words, these pompous words, speaking against the Most High. And uh, it is in that time that the kingdom from which this little horn rose is being destroyed. But yet the, the other kingdoms are continuing for a season and a time. That means the people's... Remember, these king, these beasts came out of the seas, meaning out of the nation. So peoples of those nations, they're continuing on for a season and a time. It's going on. And it is at that moment, the Son of Man. So this is a very important title. The title that Jesus used for himself, the Son of Man. Verse 13. So here we see... We're getting a picture of the Godhead, God the Father on the throne, God the Son of the eternal world, the Son of God, Son of Man, is there in the very presence of God the Father. And to him is given all the kingdoms, the glory, verse 14, the dominion, the glory, the kingdom is given to him, and he gives it to the saints. We see this later on. Uh, uh, he gives it, this is in verse 22, uh, he gives it to the saints. Right? So now begins the interpretation. Okay, what does all this mean? Verse 15. So Daniel says, obviously, you know, I'm very troubled. Like, what, what are all these strange images and what is going on? And then he sees a being. We, you know, it's, we don't know who, I'm not mentioning who it is, but. Uh, whether it's an angelic being or an elder in heaven, you know, he just asks, you know, what is the meaning of this verse 16? And now the meaning is being given to us from verse 17. Right? So that is why, uh, you know, when we're trying to understand scripture, we just look into the scripture itself. The interpretation is there. Right? So verse 17, he's saying, look, the beasts, that you saw. So all these, these four beasts, strange creatures, they are representing something. What are they representing? They are representing four kingdoms. Uh, if you see the word four kings and then you see the footnote there or a side note, it's actually four kingdoms. So immediately you say, hey, this matches what we saw in chapter two. There also he's talking about four, he gave us four kingdoms. We're seeing this here, four kingdoms, right? So there's a parallel, and so that's why this image that we see, we can map, okay, the similarity here, right? And then verse 18, then the saints will receive the kingdom and possess. So that connects back to chapter 2, 
when the God of heaven set up his kingdom here on earth, the rock that came and crushed the image and the, became a big mountain. So that connects that when God is setting up his kingdom, verse 18, the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom. They will become a church. Right? So that happens when God sets up his kingdom. The verse 19, he says, okay, uh, what about this fourth beast? Right? Uh, because it's very different from the others. And, uh, uh, and these ten horns, what happens? What's about that? Was was 20. And the little horn, uh, which suddenly appeared and uh, started speaking on these things. Um, and verse 21, this little horn is making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So Daniel 7.21 maps to Revelation chapter 12, where, uh, uh, where you know, uh, it talks to us about um, the time, Revelation 12 and 13, when it's in the second half of the tribulation, when um, uh, the, the serpent is, is attacking uh, the people of God, Revelation 12, verse 15, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 through verse 17, the dragon was enraged and he went after, uh, uh, he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. The woman representing the nation of Israel, um, uh, the offspring representing the Jews who believe in God and those who keep the commandments of God. So Revelation 12, 17, maps there to Daniel 7, 21, when the, the horn was making war against the saints and was prevailing against them. So there is that relation, which we can see that parallel. And in chapter 13, when the Antichrist and the false prophet are attacking everybody who believes in Jesus. And so we can see that parallel, uh, Daniel 7, 21, was with Revelation 12 and 13, right? So there's a time when this same horn, this little horn, is making war against the saints, going after the people who are believing in the Lord. And then comes the Ancient of Days intervening and uh, the, set, the, the Kingdom of God is established here on earth. Okay? So uh, what is the meaning of all this? Verse 23 says, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom, which is different from all other kingdoms. So in chapter 2, he talked about the legs of iron, which are going to be very powerful. And here we're seeing this fourth beast. And then he says, verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So now we can map the ten horns. In chapter 2, we saw ten toads. But what about the ten toes? They're coming out of, from the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom then kind of disintegrates. It breaks into small, small pieces. Iron is mixed with clay. Right? It's in that, that's the condition. And you have ten toes. So here he is saying there are ten horns. So the ten horns here correspond to ten toes. But what are these ten horns? Verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings. So horns in scripture are talking about kings or rulers or leaders. Right? Will come from this kingdom. That means from a region that belonged, that was occupied by or belonged to this fourth beast or the legs of iron. From that place will come these ten horns. So, this is why we are very interested in the territory that was occupied by the form or by the former former Roman Empire, which is basically uh, today much of the European Union, right? All of Europe, or most of Europe, extending all the way across the Mediterranean into Turkey, uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa. All of that was region occupied by this Roman Empire the, at its 
peak all the way from Spain across Eastern Europe, going on into Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, all of that, Northern Africa. It's all occupied by the Roman Empire, which legs of iron are represented by the fourth beast. Then what happened? It became disintegrated iron mixed with clay, which is what we are seeing today. But what belongs to the former Roman Empire is now lots of people, every people from all over the nation, all over the nations, all there living there. It's all mixed. Small, small, small countries all across that region. But what Daniel said was, from this, verse 24, 10 horns or 10 kingdoms shall arise from this kingdom. That means from this same region, there will be 10 leaders. So that's why we look very uh, at much interest. Okay, you know, there are many leaders, all the most prominent leaders coming ar arising from this region, this iron mixed with clay, this region that once belonged to the Roman Empire. For those leaders coming. And then he says, another will arise and he will overpower three of them. So we're looking for a little horn, meaning somebody who seems very insignificant. But he's going to overpower three of these 10 leaders. He's going to bring them under his influence, under his control. Uh, in some way, you know, he's going to basically. Uh, prop himself up with their, you know, with their support, and he's going to come into position. Now, this little home we can understand is representing the Antichrist, as we will see. We will see as we go forward, chapter eight, chapter nine, uh, and uh, chapter eleven. Uh, we will see that this little home is actually the Antichrist. So. In um, chapter 8, we get more details on where this little horn will come from. Right now, we are saying he's coming from some area that belonged to the former Roman Empire. And he's going to influence three of the ten other leaders who are going to emerge. And it is this little horn who's going to speak all these pompous words against the Most High. So, so much we are understanding now. Right? This is in verse 24. He'll be different from the first ones. He will subdue three kings. He's going to overpower three things. And verse 25, he's going to speak pompous words against the Most High and persecute the saints of the Most High, which, like we saw in Revelation 12 and chapter 13, this is the, what the Antichrist will do. He's going to persecute the saints of the Most High. And he's also going to do something. Verse 25, Daniel 7, 25. He will intend to change times and law that means this, anti, this, this little horn who comes into power, he is going to try to affect times and law. The customs, the way things are being done, and what the you know governance, how people are being governed, he is going to be influencing that. And it says here. The saying shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Right? Now, this phrase, a time, times, and half a time, we will see as we progress, represents three and a half years. A time is one year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. So it is one plus two plus half, three and a half years. Right. Um, as we go read through Daniel, th this will become evident. Uh, we can say this with, with confidence because we know what happens in the book of Revelation, where in the middle of the seven years of tribulation, Antichrist will break the peace treaty, and, and the second half, three and a half years, is what he's going to, you know, he's going to really attack the saints, God's people. So what he's saying here in Daniel 7. He will intend to change times and law, the way things are being done and what governance. He will change those rules, you know, things that people have generally agreed upon, he'll change it. Uh, the law, the rules, and so on. 
And for three and a half years, he's going to overpower the saints. He's going to attack the saints, God's people. That's going, God's going to allow that to happen. And then, after that, his dominion, verse 26, God himself will sit as judge and he will take away his dominion and destroy it forever. And the kingdom, and verse 27, the kingdom and the kingdoms will be given to the saints. So the saints are going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. We know that Revelation chapter 20. Right? So, Daniel chapter 7 is so amazing because... He's talking about these four kingdoms, which actually happened, you know, starting from the Babylonian Empire on, all of that is fulfilled. And then he's going way out into time to talk about what will happen from the region that was occupied by this fourth beast, or the legs of iron. From there, there's going to be these 10 leaders, and there's going to be also a little horn, another small leader who's going to overpower, and all those things going to happen. And then, the, you know, the, the, the kingdom, God's kingdom will be established on the earth. She's kind of going way into that. So there is a near-term prophecy talking about these four empires, four kingdoms, and there's a long-term prophecy, which is at the very end of the age, when God sets up his own kingdom here on earth. So it's a beautiful chapter uh, explaining uh, all of this. Let me pause and you know we'll take any questions. Uh, I hope all of all of us understood it. Uh, uh, any questions? Or if you want me to explain it again, I can do that. Everyone, uh, is it clear? Yeah, just you know, go ahead. Uh, when you said that the ten arms and something about the Roman Empire that you said, so how do we know that it's the Roman Empire? Okay, so the question is, how do we know it's the Roman Empire? So we pick this up from chapter two, where from chapter two and also the end of chapter five. So chapter two, we know Babylonian empire. He tells us you know, the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian empire. Then after that, what happens? He said the next kingdom would be the Medes and the Persians, which he explains to us in chapter five. We will see uh, that the next kingdom in chapter eight, he once again tells us it's um, the Medes and Persians, and then he tells us about the Greek Empire. What is not mentioned in scripture is which empire is represented by those legs of iron and this fourth beast. That is not mentioned by name. But Babylonians, Medes, and Persians, and Greek is mentioned by name. We'll see in chapter 8. So, we know of the conclusion we come to, which is not mentioned in scripture, that the legs of iron and this fourth beast are representing the, Bab the Roman Empire is because, one, what we see happen in history. After the Greeks, the next, because in both Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7, he's telling us that the legs of iron are more powerful than in the previous kingdoms. This beast, the fourth beast, is unlike any other before. It's so powerful. So then we look at history. Okay, after the Greeks, which empire existed in that region which would match this kind of description, which was so powerful, which was the biggest one? Then we can say it was the uh, historically it is be what we refer to as the Roman Empire. Right? So we come to this conclusion based on history, looking back that okay, this is the empire that existed after the Greek Empire because it has to come in sequence after the Greek. 
which was more powerful than all the others. That's okay. This is the Roman Empire. So it's based on history that we concluded because it's not given to us in scripture, it's not mentioned by name, but just based on history, we see this. Any other question? Yes, Elia, please go ahead. Uh, yes, Pastor, thank you. Uh, there is uh, this uh, verse that tells um, the saints were given to the uh, to the um, beast yeah. for the yeah, time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in that portion the saints uh meaning uh, who are the saints uh that portion is referring to like mm. it, is it those ones the ones who have been left behind or those who have been um you know saved during the tribulation because if we think about in a pre-trib uh scenario yeah yeah so the saints referring here this will correspond to what we read in Revelation 12, um, uh, verse 17, uh, which is, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, which is Israel, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, Jews, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Revelation 12, 17, those are the saints. Right? That means to answer your question, these are people who come to faith in Jesus during the tribulation. So the rapture has taken place before the tribulation. The church has been taken out of the way, saints have gone. But immediately after that, there are going to be lots of people who will believe in Jesus Christ because they see all these things happening unfold. Right? A lot of them are going to die as martyrs. And it says in Re Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon, Satan, is, in, is just upset with the woman, which is in the nation of Israel. And he's going to make war with the rest of her offspring, the Jews. But very specifically, he says, the, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that means it is the people who are following Jesus Christ. You'll have these people in and around Israel, but you'll also have them all over the world. Because in chapter 13, you'll find that uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet, uh, he, uh, these two together, they are, uh, uh, you know, it says in Revelation 13, uh, uh, verse 15, that those who do not worship the image of the beast, he will put them to death. So that means the attack is on the saints, not only in Israel. Israel is going to suffer a lot. It's, you will see in Daniel 12 that it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. But the attack is against everyone who has the testimony of Jesus Christ. So to answer your question, the saints referred to in Daniel 7.25 refer to all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation. They'll come to faith in Christ. That they're going to be targets of uh, the what the Antichrist does and accompanied by the help of the false prophet, empowered by the dragon. The devil is empowering these two human agents. And the dragon is behind the Antichrist and the false prophet. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. So let's go for a break. And we will come and uh, get into chapter 8. Again, chapter 8 is quite interesting because we're getting into more detail. He's going to talk to us very specifically of the Medes, Persians, and the Greek Empire. It's very interesting. He's going to tell us, give us details about the Greek Empire, about the first leader, which we now looking back at history, we know is Alexander the Great, and exactly what he foretold happened with Alexander the Great. And then he's going to tell us about the little horn who's going to come. That's all in chapter 8. Right? So let's take a break and we'll come back. Thank you.